Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome you to our presentation today. It is another series on health, and this month we shall be dealing with or talking about the eight doctors. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we would like you to lead us this afternoon and enhance our understanding as we shall be going through the themes of health, health through your book, the Holy Bible. May you forgive our sins and anoint us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The Eight Doctors is our series. Below are the objectives of our presentation. To experience a saving health, as we read from the book of Psalms, chapter 67, verse 2. Secondly, to make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it. This we read from Testimonies to the, to the Church, Volume 3, pages, page 161 and paragraph 2. Here is a question that is commonly, commonly, commonly asked among Christians. Have you ever met anyone and they ask you this question? Are you saved? Well, in the book of Psalm chapter 67, verse 2, we read, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. So we realize from this verse that the health message is indeed salvific. And that, therefore, we need to take it seriously if we want to be saved into the kingdom of God. Are you obedient? Have you ever had this question? Um, are you obedient to God's commandments? Are you obedient to God's instructions? In the book by Ellen White, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 161, paragraph 2, we read, to make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it is the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. This is what we read concerning the third angel's message in the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse nine and 10, just to give us an idea what the prophet was talking about. And the third angels followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is a fearful message indeed. We need to take this health message seriously, brothers and sisters. The Lord wants this law or these commandments to be made plain before our eyes so that we may take heed of it and we may avoid the judgments that shall come upon those who shall receive the mark of the beast. Here is what Dr. Law says in Exodus chapter 15 and the verses 26. God said, and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in his sight and wilt give ear to his commandments and give and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that he left thee. Why am I saying that this is Dr. Law? We realize that this verse is telling us about the commandments of God and his statutes, which can be summarized by the word law. And we also realize that this law or this commandment are the laws which pertain to health because God talks about healing us, keeping these commandments or keeping these instructions, these laws, so that we may be healed because he is the God or the Lord that he left us. Therefore, we understand that God must be having some health instructions, some dietary laws, some exercise laws, and so on, as we know the law to be like. Um, we may identify these eight doctors um, 
from the word of God itself. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God talks about trusting him. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, um, the atmosphere was created so that you may have the air to breathe. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, um, man was given work to do, which was a form of exercise. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 16, we realized that the sun was created so that um, we may experience healing from the sun rays. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, verse 3, rather, God tells us about proper rest, which in this case was resting on the seventh day, which he called the Sabbath. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, um, God tells us about the water that he created so that we may benefit from it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, um, man was asked not to eat something which would ultimately um, damage him after he disobeyed. So um, this was the law of temperance as we know it. Temperance simply means self-control or avoiding that which we know to be imperfect or avoiding that which we know to be dangerous or that which we were in instructed not to partake of. And then in Genesis chapter 1 verse 29, we understand that God gave us the law of nutrition. He gave us dietary instructions as to what, what to eat. Um, in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 127, we read, pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. These are the true remedies. That is why um, this can be known as the general practitioner, the great physician himself. The great physician now is here with us today, the sympathizing Jesus. We understand that pure air is essential for health. Sunlight is as equally essential to health. And abstemiousness is another word for temperance. And then rest um, simply means that we cease from the labor. And then um, exercise simply means that we put our bodies into some activity. Proper diet simply means what we eat, the nutrients and so on. And the use of water, both internally and externally. Um, and then lastly, trusting in divine power. If we do not trust in God, we will not be able to follow the other seven principles because we need complete trustworthiness upon God and his, the instructions that he has given us to realize that they are meant for our benefit, they are meant for our health. The eight doctors at home, we may identify these eight doctors by the acronym New Start. New Start, N for nutrition, E for exercise, W for water, S for sunshine, T for temperance, A for air, R for rest, and T for another T for trust in God. These are the eight doctors that you can have freely at home at your own convenience. And after you make a choice to use them, of course. We are going to focus today on the first law of um, health or the first doctor, rather, doctor nutrition. Doctor nutrition, what is nutrition? Nutrition is the process of providing or obtaining a diet or food and nourishment necessary for health, maintenance, reproduction, and growth. That is what is known as nutrition. We read about the original diet in the word of God. The first thing that God gave to men after he created him was um, put on the list, was put um, in the word of God itself. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, verse, verse 9, we read, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So God created these food articles, these plants which were meant for food, way, way before he created men and, a man and a woman, before he created Adam and Eve. 
a healthy diet of fresh organic plant-based foods grown in rich soil is necessary for us. This was made and put into place before we were even created. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you, it shall be for meat. Genesis chapter one, the verse is 29. Yes. Um, the herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. So these plants which are able to bear seed were meant to be our food. When the King James Version says meat, it actually means flesh. It means, it doesn't, it, it actually doesn't mean flesh, but it means food as we know it. Um, we understand that nowadays when you say meat, people actually mean flesh. But in the King James Version, when they said meat, they only meant food. God gave us a variety of fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, which are found to contain all the essential vitamins, minerals, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, water, and fiber to make good blood and for us to enjoy a healthy life. We have examples of fruits right before us. There are many. We will not be able to list all of them, but I was able to at least may choose some of them which are um, common to us. Apples, 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 apples. They say two apples a day keeps the doctor away uh, because apples are doctor nutrition themselves. They are found in doctor nutrition. Bananas, pan apples, citrus fruits. Citrus fruits are many. You have the oranges, the um, lemons, the limes, um, you have kumquat, you have um, grapefruits, you have nachis, there are many citrus fruits. And they are found to be rich, very quite rich in vitamin C, which is necessary for our immune system. We have grapes, we have berries, many berries. We have mulberries, we have strawberries, we have um, blueberries, we have um, wild berries, many berries, of course. And then we have kiwi fruits, lychee, dragon fruit, watermelon. Um, in Setswana, we call it lehapu. Prickly pear, in Setswana, it's called motorogo. Monkey oranges, and in Setswana, it is called mohorohoran. It's a beautiful, nice, wild fruit. And then we have sour plum, which is also a wild fruit. In Botswana, it is called moretoloha. If you look at this purplish, food right here. It is not so common a fruit. This is the, what we call the dragon fruit. It is not so common a fruit, but it is highly beneficial, especially even for diabetics. So we need to explore the world that God has created and find out this um, essential fruits that we need for our health. Secondly, God gave us grains. We have millet. I believe that millet is a superior grain, it is highly alkaline and it is um, delicious. You would like to try it if you have never tried it. In Setswana, millet is called lebele bele, and in Kalanga, it is called zengwe. And in a language I have heard people speaking in Namibia, okay, it is called mahangu, millet. It is a good grain. We must begin to have this as often times as possible in our meals. We have red millet, which is also known as finger millet or rapogo. This is another African name, rapogo. I think this is what they call it in, Zim, in Zimbabwe. We have green millet and white millet. The most common one in Botswana is the green millet and it is delicious. And we have sorghum, these small African grains. That is why we have African names for these small African grains because they, they are originally um, from here. They are not foreign to us here in Africa. 
We have sorghum and the name for the African name or the Swana name for sorghum is Mabele. Um, we have red sorghum, we have white sorghum, and then we have these Asian grains, rice. Um, I, I have listed them in order of superiority in terms of nutritional value, black rice, red rice, brown rice and white rice and by white rice i don't i do not mean polished rice um it is possible to get white rice which has not been polished and we have oats okay rolled oats or instant oats we have barley we have rye wheat and corn these are the grains that are commonly found um, corn is the least nutrit nutritive grain on the list. That is why I put it at the end, corn and wheat. Sometimes in most cases, these are troublesome grains because a lot of people react to them. Wheat has been commercialized and hence also it, it, is, um, it is not easy to find wheat which, is, which, is not, um, has, which has not been affected with GMO ideas or corn which has not been affected with GMO ideas. And then we have legumes, beans and peas. Legumes, beans and peas. Examples of beans, we have kidney beans, black eye beans. Black eye beans are also known as cow peas. Um, we have sugar beans, we have mung beans, we have black beans, soya beans, and lentils, and so on and so forth. And then we have the peas, the green peas, the yellow peas, bambara ground nuts. In Setswana, it is called dipu. And then we have cow peas, also known as black eye beans. We have chickpeas or garbanzos, and then we have peanuts. Okay, um, peas are different from beans. They are both members of the legume family, but beans are found to be oval in shape, as we can see here, and the peas are round in shape. Peanuts are not necessarily nuts. They are just members of the pea family which tastes like nuts. That is why we do not um, put them under the list, on, on the list of nuts, but in the list of peas. And then we have the nuts. Nuts are a dry, hard fruit that does not split open at maturity. And the kernel of the nuts is edible. Examples of nuts, we have morula nuts, cashew nuts, or also known as cashews, pecan nuts, hazelnuts, Brazil nuts, chestnuts, macadamia nuts, walnuts, almonds, pistachio nuts, or also known as pistachios. These are the nuts that we should explore and, and um, use them as part of our diet regularly. We have also the seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, flax seeds, sesame seeds, kia seeds, and poppy seeds. Sesame seeds are also known as simsim in Uganda. These are the pumpkin seeds, the sunflower seeds, um, lean seeds or flax seeds and sesame seeds or simsim. Um, that was about the original diet. And then we hear about another diet in the Bible. We call it the restorative diet. In the book of Genesis chapter three, verse 18, we read, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. The herb of the field. These are the herbs as we know them, as we have. We are identifying them here in this picture. And this was something which happened after the fall of man. After man fell, because he fell even almost to the level of animals, he started eating or giving food like those of animals. If you remember in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 30, um, this herb of the field was given to animals for food, which means that originally all animals were vegetarians. They were eating or feeding on vegetables or on herbs. So after the fall of man, because now man was subject to disease and decay, remember that he, man was told that if you eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. So what actually happened was that after Adam and Eve partook of that fruit, um, they began the, the process of dying, the process of death actually began. They did not die that day, but the process of death 
began and they were not subject to disease and decay. And therefore, God in his mercy provided a diet that would help restore them back to the original form in which he made them. And in the book of Psalm chapter 104, verse 14, God says, he caused the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of men, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. So you realize that herbs were, were um, actually made for particularly servicing this human machinery that God has given us because now it was bound to break up one way or the other after sin had come into the world. So God wants us to keep these bodies in check, to keep them and keep on taking them out for service um, as we drink the herbs. And then we read about the emergency diet. After the flood, after the flood um, took place for 40 days and nights, and all the vegetation was damaged or destroyed, there was actually nothing for Adam and Eve to eat from the vegetation. Um, and Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, God then gave them flesh diet to eat. He said, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. In other words, food for you, even as the green herb have I, have I given you all things. What did God mean here? Did God mean that um, we should eat every and each or and any animal which was Noah's ark made? Certainly not. That was never what God would have meant. How do we know that? We, as we read further in the Bible, we realize that God actually gave specifications. Um, and in the book Genesis chapter 9 and verse 2a, um, if you remember, um, God said, of every clean beast thou shalt take or to thee, thou shalt take to thee by servants, the male and his female. So God had a reason why he put, he asked Noah to put in the ark clean animals by servants not by twos like the unclean ones. And um, God had a reason for that. And the reason was that um, um, Noah was going to need this for food since it was an emergency diet when there was nothing else for Noah and his inmates to eat. Um, they had to take the clean animals, which all of them of course, were vegetarians. They were they were um, um, herbivores. Okay, they were animals which fed on herbs. So it was secondary food, yes, but it was a better secondary food because these were the animals which were eating the same herbs that God had said that Adam and I mean Adam and Eve should eat. That God had said that human beings should eat. So since the herbs were not available, um, um, God decided that. Noah and his family would partake of these clean animals. And um, the other specification, we find it in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 6, which says, um, it shall be eaten the same day ye offer it. And on the morrow, and if, if ought remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. So God allowed, when he allowed them to eat um, flesh, he only allowed them to eat it within three days because on the fourth day, putrefaction of the flesh had already started and it was no longer fit for consumption. Today, we understand that we have um, refrigerators that will um, increase the shelf life of the flesh food which you have. Same way it increases the shelf life of a corpse at the mortuary, okay? Um, that's why, um, when, the, when Christ performed the, miracle, performed the miracle of raising up Lazarus from the, from the dead, he came on the fourth day, okay? And the Bible says he was four days late. But when he came, um, he just wanted to make sure that people um, were aware that the flesh of Lazarus has, had already begun to putrefy and it can never be resuscitated to life. But indeed, we understand and know that Christ worked a miracle to raise Lazarus from the dead on the fourth day. So it was beyond doubt. It was beyond doubt that 
um, Lazarus actually had died and therefore only supernatural power would have resuscitated him. And we also have restriction, restrictions upon the flesh diet which was given. Um, of course, God said, go ahead and eat it, but he had restrictions. In the book of Genesis chapter seven, verse two, we read about the unclean animals and of the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So Noah was asked to put the unclean animals two by two, just to preserve the seed, just to preserve the family, um, the, 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 the seed of, just to preserve the species, that particular species. But for those which were meant for food, um, um, they were put seven by sevens, just so that there could be something to be eaten. And then when you eat whatever it is that you shall be eating, there shall be something less left just to preserve the species, okay? And another restriction was the blood. Genesis chapter nine, verse four, soon after God gave men to eat flesh, he said, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat? So God was clear, no blood to be consumed. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings, Leviticus chapter seven, and the verse is 26. So God was clear that no man of blood should be eaten. And in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 12, God repeats, therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. So God was particular about blood not to be partaken of. And the next restriction that we read of is the fat, the animal fat. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, ye shall eat no manner of fat of ox or of sheep or of goat. Leviticus chapter seven and the verses 23. So no fat, no animal fat was supposed to be consumed just to avoid um, a high consumption of cholesterol, which we know to be assailing a lot of people who have got problem with obesity, um, diabetes, and so on. Clean and unclean animals. This is a summary of what God meant by clean and unclean animals and this evidence um, given, biblical evidence given for this. We have the mammals, the bears, the reptiles, the water animals, and the insects. And there were two qualifications, cloven hoofs and chewing of the cud. The unclean ones, which were noticed to be the carnivores and those not meeting both clean qualifications were the ones which were called unclean animals. And with the birds, those not specifically listed are the, the, the only ones which can be eaten were those which were not specifically listed as forbidden. But the ones which were lifted, listed as forbidden were the birds of prey or scavengers as we read in the verses um, outlined down here. And with the reptiles, none of them were, were identified as cleans. And all of the reptiles were rendered unclean. And as for the water animals, we have two qualifications. The fish that has got fins and they also have got scales at the same time, as outlined in these verses. And then the unclean ones, any fish or any water animal that does not meet the qualifications here was rendered unclean. And as for the insects, those in the grasshopper family as are rendered in these verses here. And then the unclean ones were the winged quadrupeds or those that had got, that had four, four legs, okay? Um, let's look at, at the factors that influence food choices. What are the factors that influence food choices? We have biological determinants, hunger, appetite, and taste, okay? When Eve, when Mother Eve was, was, was um, tempted to eat, she looked at that fruit, I don't think she was hungry. And I believe it was between meals. She was going to be eating between meals because it was not a meal time, okay? And she looked at it and she thought that it was good to be eaten. She started having appetite and she began to taste it. 
okay? Because she wanted to be wiser. The, the snake had deceived her in that she was going to be as wise as God. So these are bi biological determinants, hunger, appetite, and taste. Psychological determinants, pleasure, emotional comfort, mood, stress, and guilt. Sometimes when we have emotional problems, we take so solace in finding something to eat. Social interactions like ethnic traditions, culture, family, peer, peers, and meal patterns. Okay, so um, um, we eat food sometimes because it is, it is our culture to eat it, not necessarily because it is healthy or it is not healthy. So these are um, inf um, factors that influence food choices. And the next one is attitude, habit, beliefs, and knowledge. Sometimes it is because of religious beliefs that we decide to eat certain things, or just because we have an attitude towards a certain food article, then we decide not to eat it. Economy, okay? The cost, the income, and the availability. Sometimes you are not able to eat certain food articles because they are expensive. And if they would be available and inexpensive, we would probably partake of them. Okay. And sometimes because it is that it, it is because they're not just they're just not available around us. Personal preference, okay. And in most cases, this is just personal preference. And in, in some cases, it is because of convenience. Okay. I found myself, I have found myself when I'm traveling and I don't have time to pick up stuff and cook and sit down for a meal to eat. I, I, I would buy maybe just fruits, not because it is a meal time for fruits, I would just, but just buy maybe a snack or something, dried fruits or something and just chew on it as I travel. So that is just a matter of convenience. It may be a matter of time. Okay, so um, some, in some cases we may be eating because it is time to eat. Okay, why do we eat? Why do we eat? In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 28, verse 22, we read, Now therefore, I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. So we realize that the, the Bible um, highlights the fact that we, uh, we, 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 we have to be eating for strength. When we are about to take off for some work or to go and do something. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 17, we read, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and the princess eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Okay, so we eat for energy so that we may have strength to be able to partake of the duties that are ahead of us. We also eat for nutrient intake, for nutrient intake. This is what the Bible is teaching us. What are nutrients? This word keeps on coming. What are nutrients? Nutrients are supposed to produce energy. When we eat food, nutrients provide essential building blocks for all body's needs and functions. Nutrients protect the body from many chronic diseases. Nutrients are, in, are necessary for our normal functioning. So there are six classes of nutrients as we know them. Carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, minerals, fats, and water. These are the six classes of nutrients. What are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are the main sources of energy. They are converted into starches and sugars when we begin to chew on our food. And they are classified as organic compounds, meaning that in the molecular structure, they contain carbon. Carbohydrates produce least waste when used for energy. So when they are the primary source of energy, okay, which is supposed to be the case, that is why carbohydrates, with their, they are normally called energy giving food, okay? Because they give us energy, um, yet they produce least waste when we are using them as energy. So they're excellent for giving us energy. Fiber is a type of a carbohydrate and 
fiber is actually absent in animal food. There is no animal food article that has got the trace of fiber. And fiber, it is not digested by our bodies, but it is meant to keep the intestines clean. Fiber is actually the broom for your alimentary canal. It is the broom that will sweep out waste from your colon. It is the broom that will sweep, sweep out waste from your intestines. So it is highly necessary. It is part of, um, it, it is a type of a carbohydrate which is meant to sweep out waste from our, our intestines. So when we partake mostly of animal products, we therefore suffer, tend to suffer from constipation because there is nothing, nothing to sweep off waste from our intestines, from our colon. Proteins, they are meant for energy production and it is a moderate source of energy. They promote growth. They are needed in repairing the cells, in cellular repair. They, they, they are involved in the formation of DNA and enzymes. Um, they do many things in the human body, okay? And they are also identified as organic compounds. Vitamins, on the other hand, are also organic compounds. They are needed in small amounts. They are also needed for metabolic and other body processes. Okay, so we are only supposed to partake of vitamins um, in moderation. And then minerals are virtually not destructible elements. They help facilitate chemical reactions. They are also composed of identical atoms. Um, minerals are inorganic, meaning that they contain no carbon in their molecular structure. Fats, they are also a moderate source of energy. They are needed for production of hormones and for absorption of vitamins A, D, E, and K. These are fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. And fats help restore energy in the body. Fats are also organic compounds, meaning that they contain carbon in their molecular structure. How about water? Water is made of two elements as we know it, hydrogen and oxygen. So H2O as we know it is the water. It is classified as an inorganic compound, meaning that it contains no carbon in its molecular structure. Of course, it doesn't contain any carbon. And then it is needed for nearly all body processes. So water is vital. It is an essential nutrient in our bodies. How often should we eat? How often should we partake of this wonderful nutrition, nutritional foods? In the verse that we have already read, at least yesterday, chapter 10, verse 17, we want to dig another principle from there. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princess eat in due season, for strength and not for drunkenness. Okay? So eating in due season meaning mean, simply means that you need to be having regular meal times of eating or regular, um, um, I would say not necessarily eating times, but also fasting times. Okay, because when you when 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 you when you space your meals with five hours, the 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 hours in between simply means that it's a time when you have fasted, you're not eating. So we should have fasting times in between each meal and have set times for meal. There should be a time for breakfast and there should be a time for lunch and there should be a specific time for your supper. Our, our bodies have got inbuilt clocks and they respond better and they become healthier when we um, follow a certain routine. Um, which follows a certain period of time or a certain due season. Okay, so in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6, we realize that when God sent the ravens to go and feed Elijah the prophet, um, it says, the Bible says, the ravens, the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. So here we realize the Bible teaching us another principle of having a two meal diet plan. Even Christ, um, he would eat before he would take off to be a minister to the people and eat when he comes back or when he is finally done. So we also realize this two meal plan is common throughout the Bible. Um, we read from this website, perfectketo.com. 
uh, the author says, if you can do intermittent fasting, this is fasting for 16 to 18 hours a day, you will burn through your body fat and fill up quickly when you break your fast, which makes it easy to stay in a calorie deficit and lose weight. At this stage of fasting, you may also enjoy a boost in brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. Okay, so and the, the 18 hour fast or the 16 to 18 hour fast is highly beneficial. So if you space your meals with, um, suppose you, you take five to six hours between meals and you just have breakfast and lunch. For example, if you have your breakfast at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, one, two, then you can have your lunch at two o'clock in a space of six hours. So from two o'clock, and if you decide to sleep at 10 or at nine, okay, you will, you will be sleeping on an empty stomach, okay? And if you have your breakfast the following day at eight, you would have had about 18 hours of fasting, which is highly beneficial as we read in this website. Um, it is said that we should be eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and supper like a slave or a pauper. A king is known to eat a variety of things and a whole lot in terms of, in terms of the size of the food that they eat. And the queen will eat slightly less and then um, the, 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 the pauper or the slave will eat little or nothing. So if we are going to have a third meal, we should have it light, but it is typical of us to eat a heavy meal for supper, just before bed, most people eat a heavy meal and that is um, harmful to the human system. We should be um, making, um, um, we should be making a decision to uh, part ways with this kind of lifestyle and begin to practice a lifestyle where you can eat a large amount of breakfast because you are going to take off and work throughout the day Okay, and eat little or nothing when you're about to sleep because you don't need energy for sleeping. Sleeping do not need any strength. Why are we supposed to space meals? In the book, Minister of Healing, page 4, paragraph one by Ellen White, it says, after disposing of one meal, the digestive organs need rest. At least five or six hours should intervene between the meals. And most persons who give the plan a trial will find that two meals a day are better than three. Okay. Councils of on diets and foods, page 182, and the paragraph is four. Ellen White says, a second meal should be should never be eaten until the stomach has had time to rest from the labor of digesting the preceding meal. If a third meal be eaten at all, it should be light and several hours before going to bed. But with many, the poor, tired stomach may complain of weariness in vain. So when we overload our system with food and eating between meals, eating anyhow, haphazardly, and so on, we are actually wearying our system and um, we will suffer the consequences in the ultimate time. What are the benefits of fasting? Let us look at the benefits of fasting. A six hour fasting, this is now when you are spacing your meals by six hours. A six hour fasting gives you a stable blood sugar. Okay? Your blood sugar levels will be stable if you space your meals with six hours. An 18 hour fasting, this is now between the last second meal of the day and the next breakfast. It gives you 18 hours of fasting. It burns your fat, gives you and gives you mental clarity. So if you want to lose weight, you better um, um, choose the 18 hour fasting because it will help you bend the fat and it, also, it will also help you have a mental clearness. And the 24 hour fasting has been known to repair and recycle all old damaged body cells. It also reduces inflammation and gives you longevity. So when you for example, maybe suppose you pick up one day, 24 hours of fasting, once in a week. This will help to reduce inflammation and it will also give you longevity. You will live longer, 
when you do that, just make it a lifestyle, make it a habit that one day in a week, you are fasting for 24 hours. You will have your cells being repaired and being recycled, the damaged cells. Okay, so um, I have noticed this to be beneficial even in terms of um, the current pandemic. Okay, um, if you realize when you have one of the symptoms of, of, of um, COVID-19 is lack of appetite, loss of appetite, loss of sense of smell, loss of sense of taste, okay? Um, I would like us to look at those um, um, from the positive side, okay? So if you can't smell food, if you can't taste it, it is horrible to eat, okay? What sensitizes our taste buds is the sense of smell, the sense of taste, okay? And that's what makes us enjoy food, okay? So, and the loss of appetite, actually it forces you to fast. Why? Because inflammation is one of the major dangerous symptoms. So you heal faster when you are fasting. Please note that even one day of fasting, you will reduce inflammation that would otherwise take place within your lungs. Okay, so, and then a 48 hour fasting increases the production of the growth hormone. This is one study which was done, one scientific study which was done in on the 1st of April, 1992. Okay, um, and that is the website, you can go and check it out from that, that web website. And then an extended fast, this is now the one that goes beyond 48 hours. An extended fast makes the repaired cells and tissues more efficient. It hastens healing. So if you have been infected with COVID-19, for example, don't worry about not eating and do not force anyone to eat when they don't feel like eating when they have flu, okay? Just let them be. And there's, there is a reason why um, God wants you to fast around that time. If you remember very well, um, when you have flu, you are advised to drink hot fluids or hot water, hot ginger tea, hot cayenne pepper tea, hot turmeric tea, okay? And drinking hot fluids um, is actually a way to expel the mucus. It is an expectorant on its own. I believe we have discussed that in the previous um, um, discussions on hydrothermal immune boost. So when you drink hot fluids, um, they help you in terms of being expectorant, just expelling the mucus from your system so that your lungs can, can, can rest for a while from the congestion of mucus. Okay, and then hot fluids have also been identified to stop the production of gastric juices, which means that when you drink those hot, hot cayenne pepper tea, hot ginger tea, hot whatever tea, hot water, when you have flu, you're actually stopping the production of gastric juice. That's why God decides to give you no appetite. Because if you force yourself to eat, your food will, will take longer to be digested because you have stopped the production of gastric juices within your stomach. And the food will remain there without being digested, okay? And then what will happen is that you'll have constipation, you will have bloating, you will even vomit it out, which is what happens in most cases. So when somebody has got flu and they don't, have appetite, just let them be. Understand that that fasting period of time, or it can even be an extended fasting. It can be three days, seven days, um, so long as you are you are healing in that process. It is okay. You will not die from not eating for seven days. You'll actually be repairing tissues, um, um, hastening your healing, and and increasing the production of growth hormone, and also reducing inflammation. So your lungs will heal faster if they are inflamed. If you have in, um, um, inflammation in your lungs, it will be cleared off quickly. Okay. So the benefit, another benefit of fasting is spiritual focus. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 21, we read, How we eat this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So you need spiritual in, intense intensity. You need to intensify your spirituality when you are going to cast off a demon. 
from someone or even from yourself. If you are going to pray of some demon, sometimes the demons don't go away unless you have a spiritual focus, a certain degree, a higher degree of spiritual focus, which can only be, be taking place when you are fasting. And that spiritual focus is able to be, to be activated because um, you have tissue repairing, you have concentration, okay, you have more, 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 more brain clarity and there's more healing and therefore um, you are able to focus more on God in that regard and also in, in, in resisting the powers, the, the, the dark powers of, of Satan himself. So those are the benefits of fasting as we know them. Have you ever eaten for drunkenness? How would you know that? If you feel tired after eating, it means that you have eaten for drunkenness. In the book Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 17 we read, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princess eat in due season, for strength and not for drunkenness. This is the same verse that we have read, we have read twice before. We find a third principle from the same verse. Um, we should eat but not for drunkenness. We should eat but not until we are tired. These are the reasons that may um, you may be feeling tired after eating. If you find yourself being tired after eating, check out these reasons. You may have had you may have had wrong food combination. You may have overeaten or gluttony. You may have not exercised enough. You may have nutrient deficiencies. You may have food allergies or food intolerance. You may have food additives in your food. You may have a chronic condition like diabetes. You may have behaving stress or anxiety. So the best thing for you to not to eat for drunkenness, if you have the right food combination, is not to overeat, just eat a little enough to make you feel full, okay? You eat enough until you have this, the feeling of satiety. And at the same time, you should be able to eat um, to the extent that you still feel like you can, you can still add something. There can be space for another thing, for something else to, 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 to put into your, into your mouth, okay? Um, after eating, if you want to avoid that, make sure you take what you call a digestive walk, okay? Make sure that you don't have nutrient deficiencies. And if you have food allergies, attend to them. And then, um, and then or avoid the food that are giving you allergies, okay? And then avoid foods that have got dangerous additives, okay? And then if you have chronic conditions like diabetes, make sure that you are working towards reversing it the natural way. And when you have stress or anxiety, just decide not to eat, okay? You can eat in the second meal when you are relaxed, all right? These are the dangerous food additives. Just, I've decided to put just some of them, not all of them. The list is long. You can visit that website to go and check all of them out. They, the, the website has got about 30 dangerous additives. These are commonly found in the foods that we eat from the, from the supermarkets, from the store, okay? From the, um, mostly from um, just a collection of junk food, okay? E102, this is also known as tetrazine. It is a food coloring. Uh, it may give you hyperactivity, as in the case of ADHD. It may give you asthma. It may give you cancer. And then we have polyxylsterate, which is also an emulsifier, E430. Okay, it will give you cancer. And then we have E627, which is disodium um, guanylate. guanylate which is a, a, a flavor enhancer. It will give you hyperactivity and asthma. And we have E951, which is aspartame, which is a common sweetener, especially for diabetics. It will give you hyperactivity, asthma, and cancer. So we have to avoid these food additives. In the book Isaiah chapter 55, verse 2, we read, um, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? It is a question and your labor for that which satisfieth not, hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. We should be fond of reading food labels just to identify whether whatever is there is meant to be food or not. Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 17, the Bible says, be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. 
why should I thou die before thy time? It is it's a question. God keeps on asking us questions. Why are you eating something which is not food? I never identified that as food, but you are eating it. Why? Why do you spend money to buy something which I never told you that it is it's supposed to be eaten? Why do you want to die young? Why do you want to cut your days of life? God wants us to have longevity, brothers and sisters. So the question comes, do you feel tired when fasting? There may be a reason why you feel tired when fasting. Um, and the reason may be because you have a blow, a low blood sugar level. Okay, excuse me. Um, you have a low blood sugar level and you have, um, this may take place during intermittent fasting, okay? Remember when you have intermittent fasting, that is the fasting that takes place um, for 18 hours, um, your blood sugar level will, levels will drop in that regard. So, and another reason may be because you have weak adrenal glands, okay? And in, if, if you understand that it is that case of having weak adrenal glands, you may just want to take um, a, weak, a weak solution of pink salt. A weak solution of pink salt, you may just take one eighth of a teaspoon into a glass of water and drink just to boost your adrenal glands. And you may have an intoxicated liver, okay? And if, he, if, for example, sometimes if you are fasting, because fasting has a way of arousing toxins from wherever they had been thrown, thrown away, and um, then they kind of overwhelm the liver, and then the liver becomes even more intoxicated. So you need to find a way of flushing out the liver or eating food which will clean up the liver or take care of the of the health of the liver. So you may take, in this case, um, if the liver has been, is overwhelmed, you may want to take some dandelion juice, okay? And you may be feeling weak with, during fasting because your stomach is not acidic enough and you may have a heartburn. So in this case, you can just take um, a, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in water and drink. And make sure that you use the apple cider vinegar that, that has got a mother in it. Okay, it has some, some, okay, I use the word a mother or a scoby, okay? A scoby, some, if it, you'll find some, some brownish um, weed, um, like tiny little things which you'll be hanging inside or sometimes which will be right at the bottom of the, of the, of the ACV. That is called the mother. So you need to use the, the ACV, which has got that brown, um, brown thing inside of it. And you may be feeling weak because you, have, you are low on vitamin Bs, okay? On the B vitamins. And in that case, you may want to take a probiotic. Okay, so and if you are feeling tired or very weak when fasting, you may um, bring back your strength just by taking a walk or exercising. Um, just exercise your muscles. Um, we kind of um, want to relax and sleep and um, just give in to, to the tiredness when we are fasting. But that is not the case. Just find a way of um, being active, of activating your muscles they will actually give you some energy, okay? So, yeah, what is the conclusion thereof? What is the conclusion? We are coming to the end of our presentation. What is the conclusion? In the book, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31, we read, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So whatever it is that you choose to eat, make sure that it is good for your body because it is only when you don't destroy your body that God will be glorified. It is only when we eat according to the principles outlined in the word of God 
that God will be glorified. God will be happy about your choices and therefore he will take glory in your, the choices that the kind of choices that you have made. So whatever it is that you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God, brothers and sisters. And the conclusion here we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and the verses 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. He began by um, outlining the objectives that we want to encourage people to keep the health law, to keep the commandments of God and his health statutes. Um, and this is the conclusion. This is the whole duty of men. It is to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the only thing that God wants us to do, to be obedient to him and to experience salvation as outlined in the 67th chapter of the book of Psalms and the verses two, that thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among nations. So this is the conclusion. Godly trust, open air, daily exercise, sunshine, proper rest, lots of water, always temperate nutrition. Today we have dealt with nutrition. And the next presentation will be, we, will, we shall be talking about another doctor, which is Dr. Exercise. Dr. Exercise will be what we shall be talking about in the next presentation. And thank you very much for your attention. Shall we end with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we would like to thank you so much once more for taking us through and for allowing us to finish this on time. May you forgive our sins and may you enhance the understanding of the themes of nutrition as we have read them through your word. Help us, Lord, that you may be able to comprehend these messages, that we may make the right choices and that we may not eat anything that shall destroy our bodies, but we shall eat everything that shall bring, to your, your, but that, that, that shall bring glory to your holy name. Help us, dear Father, may you anoint us with the Holy Ghost, be with us throughout the day. Bless us in these holy hours. For this we pray and ask in the saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Bye.